really happy to be here and to share a little bit of what we're doing here in TILF. And I've got two hats on. On the one side, I'm a manager of the Innovation Lab, so just two slides on that. And on the other side, I, I just finished my PhD research, and I'm going to go in more into detail on that. Um, but first, uh, Simon introduced it already uh, quite well. So the Innovation Lab is trying to enhance sports performance of competitive, competitive uh, as well as recreational athletes. And we do that by giving them more and more scientific knowledge uh, to develop scientific knowledge together with the sports. And if necessary, we also make innovative products uh, together with companies uh, and make sure if we have some real nice innovations here, it will also um, uh, build together with the competitive athletes. We also want to make that available for the recreational athletes. And um, the scientific knowledge is also why, why I maybe got the job as a manager, because it's also my background. I'm a sports scientist. I did my master's in Groningen. And uh, five years ago, I also started my PhD research on uh, performance development in speed skating. And last Monday, I, I, I uh, defended my thesis and I finally can call myself a doctor in philosophy. Uh, so I'm a little bit really happy still about the day and, and the nice uh, process. And I'm happy here to, to share uh, the knowledge with you here. And as, um, well, I'm, as a manager, I try to bring science to practice, but it's also my personal goal. So also in my research, I try to do everything to get the scientific knowledge closer to practice. I think it's a great gap still between the two disciplines. Um, and therefore, I created a website staying on track with all the information um, we made together also with the ICU uh, and the Royal Dutch Speed Skating Association an animated video with the most important results. Uh, we made two coach tools about performance trackers and pacing uh, trackers, so based on the data we gathered during my uh, research. And finally, uh, we already did the ISU e-learning webinar, so uh, I've got a more extended version of this talk uh, online at the ISU uh, website, and this seminar to give you guys uh, a short head heads up, and I'm also interested about what you think and what might be the future also of, of this kind of research. Um, and before I get started, I wanted to have a, a short notice on this scientific model we use in uh, Groningen when we study sport performance development. Um, and I will not go too much into detail, but the main, most important thing is the square in the middle. And it's about when you have sport performance, it's always an interaction of the task, environment and the individual. Um, and this is the puzzle we try to solve when doing research. And most of the time you do it puzzle piece by piece. Um, and for this, I started with the development of sport performance. Uh, and then we looked at more the individual characteristics but I did my research in the Netherlands mainly. So this is a totally different environment uh, than maybe uh, you guys are working uh, because it's all the sport performance and the development over ages is all depends also about the environment. So what kind of uh, school do you go? Can you combine your school with performance? What kind of coaches do you have? What's the competition level of your country? How many competitors are there? Um, so keep that in mind when I go into detail of my, it, it's into uh, my research. Um, and of course the task characteristics. I'm focusing only on the 1500 meter. The middle distance for me the most interesting because, because there is a 50-50 contribution both uh, the anaerobic and aerobic energy system. Um, so keep that in mind uh, while we go through some of the results. And to start with, I want to show you the short video of three minutes with the most important results of, uh, of the research. Doing sports is healthy. The more you do it, the better you get. Many sports organizations scout talents at a young age, but not everyone reaches the top and past performances are no guarantee for the future. Based on scientific research, there are four important components that can help skaters in their development to the top. How to reach the top? The world record of the 1500 meters has improved by about 10 seconds in 30 years. To compare performance over several decades, the 1500 meter times are shown as a percentage of the world record valid on the day of the race. Here you can see the performance development of 163 skaters 
who reached the top in the 1500 meters. 100% is the world record. Horizontally, the age, and vertically, the time as a percentage of the world record. With this tool, you can see whether you are on track to become the new Olympic champion. Skate your best 1500 meters time. We call pacing the distribution of energy over a race. The juniors have a relatively fast start, but a slower middle section during the race compared to adult skaters. As they get older, they learn to hold on to the speed in the middle of the race, making them faster. Faster juniors also have a better pacing than the less performing juniors. Why is it so difficult to maintain that speed? The ideal body position is with small knee angles, a horizontal upper body and small sideways push-off angles. During the gliding phase, less blood goes to the leg muscles due to the small knee angles and high static forces. Due to fatigue, technique deteriorates. Skaters tend to sit higher and will encounter more aerodynamic resistance. This makes it difficult to maintain speed. You can also see this decline with the best juniors, but they distinguish themselves by sitting deeper from the start. Can you change your pacing behavior easily? Compared to cyclists, it's harder for skaters to adjust their pacing behavior on a short term. This is probably because skaters have to carry their own body weight, while cyclists are supported by the bicycle. Fatigue then has a greater effect on technique and performance. Nevertheless, it has been found that juniors do change their pacing behavior on the long term. The better performing juniors do this faster than their peers. Each individual develops differently, and this research is not a guarantee of success. But to get closer to your Olympic dream, you can use this research as a useful tool to evaluate and improve your performance, pacing and technique with your coach. Find your own track and do enjoy the beautiful sport. For more information, read the thesis at www.stayingontrack.nl. Right, so, so what you saw in three minutes were my four, the four articles uh, I published. Um, and it's, uh, I can divide it in two parts. The upper part is more the sport performance development. We go into that in more detail. And also the second part is more the underlying performance mechanisms like uh, technique and pacing, a little bit fatigue. Uh, all focused at, the, um, uh, at what you can see during the race. Uh, and as I told you, we also had the e-learning webinar and we have a more ex extended uh, version of what I'm saying now and it's divided in two parts. So if you're curious, oh, it's on the paper, I think. Um, you can have a look there. Uh, but let's start with the first part. So sport performance development towards elite performance. Um, and um, in that case, I was the first question I was thinking, I wanted to use the information of the previous athletes who made it to the elite level and use that as maybe an advice or benchmarks for the future elites. But the first question you then, then, then come up to is how can you compare this different generation if you look at performance during a 1500 meter? Uh, and the biggest problem is that is that the sport is evolving so that in general, we get faster and faster, um, partly because of the innovations, partly because of that our training is better or our development of the youth, youth athletes is getting better. Um, but the fact is that performances increase, uh, are still increasing. So if you want to compare somebody who's skating in, uh, even in 1999 with 2010, it's a big difference. And as you saw in the video, that's in the past 20 years, the world record changed with 10 seconds. Uh, so if you want to compare athletes, we need to correct for that. Um, and we did that and we were also curious uh, just by um, having the 1500 meter divided by the world record to have uh, another value, the percentage somebody is above the world record as a new variable to measure performance. Uh, and some statistics in the left uh, uh, bottom corner. But what we saw is that by adjusting it for the world record, uh, we removed uh, most of the effect or actually everything uh, of the development over, of speed skating over the years. 
So with that, we are able to compare different generations um, and, well, get more into detail in the data. And what we did, <coughs> we used 20 years of speed skating data in the Netherlands, so from 1993 to 2013. And we took everybody who, was with, uh, who skated within 110% of the world records. So uh, at the moment, the world record for, for senior male is 1 minute 40 seconds. So it's around 1 minute and 50 seconds, that what we account as elite performance. We looked at all people who made it from the <coughs> past uh, 20 years. And we finally got 163 athletes who were able to do so. Uh, male and female together and uh, we plotted their performance development over the years so here they were 13 years old towards 26 years old and the black line is the average line of their performance development on a 1500 meter and the y-axis is the percentage above world records so here's the world record you see nobody gets here because we only use Dutch time, so we're not close to the 100%. And the gray area is actually the area in which, well, well the broad range in which all athletes uh, skated at the different ages. Um, I thought, well, this is interesting. So you kind of have an elite performance benchmark at which uh, uh, juniors might focus if they want to develop their performance. So how fast should I be to even well, to be on track uh, towards this uh, elite performance, um, but also to see how much of how many people, how many athletes are already able to skate within this benchmark. Because we always say uh, performance from now are no guarantee for the future and, and those who are the best later won't necessarily have to be the best at an early age. But still we are selecting athletes some from age 13, 15, 17 years old. And I was curious how much does that time at these young ages, uh, what does that say whether somebody can maybe make it or not? Um, and I, this is not a predictive model, but it's more like a retrospective model at which we can see, okay, how many athletes were there at that time and how many of them made it. Um, and these are the data uh, we use. The first is the elite uh, group. So we had 63 female individuals with over 600 uh, observations. 100 male athletes who we defined as an elite athlete. We have over 1,000 uh, observations, so 1,000 seasons. And from all the seasons, we took their season best time only. So not all races, only their 1,500 meter season best time. And we compared it to three other groups and from the sub elite their best performance was within 110 and 115 percent of the world records while the high competitive 115 to 120 and the last one 120 to 125. so you see that the numbers also are going up uh, for the amount of people who are able to skate at that level and then the second question is how many of them were able at younger ages to skate within these elite benchmarks as we, we describe them. Here you see all the age range from 13 to 26 years. And here again the female. And uh, this um, column defines how many skaters were within uh, uh, the elite benchmarks. And then the second one is how many of them made it to this 110% of the world record. So you see that at age 13, so here for the female, 265 Dutch junior athletes were within this funnel and that only 12% of them make it, made it. And even at age 17, 255 uh, were within the funnel. So we're able to perform really well, but only 22% of them made it to, uh, to the elite level. And only after 28 uh, years, uh, the percentage of the elite within the funnel is higher than 50%. Um, so I think this is also some, some, some numbers to reflect on um, with your own development uh, uh, teams. Like if you are good at age 17, you don't necessarily have to be there. And how many people do you want to select? Um, and are you offering enough uh, places also for your skaters? But do remember, this is over 20 years. But I think the, especially the percentage is, uh, is of interest here. Um, and, and where yeah, the, the good are separated maybe from, from uh, the good ones, uh, the better ones. Um, 
so this is one of our uh, com com um, results. And also for different research, we see that selecting athletes before age 15 is, is, is really hard to, to uh, at least even select an athlete and say this is talented or not. And I think speed skating is doing better than, for example, soccer. So we're doing <laughs> okay at soccer. They try to select talents at age six and uh, that's ridiculous. But we also think uh, that it's better to well facilitate as many athletes as, as you can to quite a quite an old, old age. Um, to minimize the talent loss. It's all dependent about your own environment, of course. <laughs> um, and second thing is then we now have kind of age-related performance goals um, because we have the average performance development of, of uh, all the athletes who made it to the elite level. And as we corrected for the world records, this number is also interpretable for future athletes. And hopefully it's quite a solid um, graph which we can use over in 20 years and we can still use in 20 years <coughs> and because i think it's quite solid we, we made an effort to put all this data into a coach tool um, which can be found probably also on the isu uh, website but in, uh, it can be found on my website so staying on track slash uh, science to practice and click on performance tracker that's the first uh, tool and uh, we actually put all the data of our research uh, in the back end there and if you put in your own skater uh, so if you go to the website you find this um, and if you start well with as young as possible you can develop the performance development of your athletes by entering oh this is better the season best time in the top their date of season best time at which they skated uh, their uh, season best time including the year then the date of birth so the tool can calculate the age at which he skated the season best time. And then of course the gender. And one is not enough. You need to click more season, which is really a performance tracker. And if you do that for multiple seasons at different ages, um, the performance tracker will build up such a graph uh, at which you compare your own athletes with the athletes of our study. So hopefully this is an easy accessible tool to uh, see how the development is. And I really want to emphasize this is the line of our best athlete uh, uh, at the moment, uh, Femke Cox, she was Olympic uh, of a, a world championship from the uh, champion from the juniors from last year. Uh, and you see that she was already quite good in the beginning and this is all public data. So you can also have a look at different athletes if you, if you want to. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, and I think, um, oh yeah, the, the, the most important thing is that you look always at the development uh, of the graph. So if somebody is here at a young age, please wait for them and see what their history is, their training load, their uh, years of competitions, uh, and follow the athlete for a couple of years. And if you see that this is way, somebody is developing way faster than the general lines here, because I also did this uh, uh, workshop for, uh, I think the skaters from, from Sweden, but there was a guy who was really like here at the moment and he was really getting into the, the funnel because he just skated for a couple of years and before that he did a different sport. So keep that in mind. Um, and that's about it for the first part for the performance tracker. Before I continue to the to pacing part, are there questions? Or is it really clear? I have one question. It's like, uh, how did you think about the equipment? Because you kind of circled like four developments yeah. in sport, like yeah. the tight suit and the <coughs> indoor skating. I think the equipment last year improved big time. That's one of the reasons the world record went up. Mm -hmm. Do you think of putting that in or because what is the age that like skaters get onto like you see the icons and sapphire skaters and so yeah. Yeah, we didn't put in why the world record changed it. Uh, we just correct for the world record in this part, but equipment is a really big uh, reason why the world record changes. And you are right if you're referring to uh, whether junior already have this new equipment or whether only the same senior have that. So, so yeah, that's not in there. But if you want to correct for that, then the tool will be maybe that hard to make <laughs> or hard to interpret. 
um, that you have no clue what's behind the data. And I think that's also important because there are really big um, uh, models also to correct for altitude at which uh, track you're skating. And I actually uh, kept myself on that kind of model to keep it simple. And I was really interested about the development of the athletes. But I agree that, that it does. Yeah, kind of same model, but because like Canadian skaters are like a lot of skating in Canada, so a lot of helped you. We say, okay, how many different tracks do you need as a mm -hmm. young skater, for instance? So. Yeah. True. Well, and with the, with the data, I think, because we did it on low level, you, you can compare the officials with the official world record and, and it's around 2 to 3% difference. So, so if you want to really compare that on high altitude, uh, you, you should re yeah, keep that in mind if you want to. Yeah. More questions? Yeah. But if, if you compare it with high altitude times, you can still, even though they'd be outside of the, the range, Yeah. Can you still compare the curve? Yeah, it will just put the curve a little bit higher. Yeah, yeah, it will, it will track it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, I think then I'll continue to the next parts, more focused on one of the underlying mechanisms of, of performance and performance development, uh, the pacing strategy. So, so how do you distribute your energy during the race and in speed skating i'm happy that we have lap times because that gives me a lot of data to get insight in the way somebody pace their race during the 1500 meter um, in this i was more focused on the junior development because i really want to explain the development of this performance over time so i was thinking what can we learn from from the elite or the best performing junior athletes here um, but first we started with some theoretical uh, models, so just to get a little bit into the um, theory, there were some models based on aerodynamic resistance and the uh, physiological capacity you have. And it was predicted that if skaters who start more uh, faster, they would skate also faster than, than they do at the moment. But when we try that in practice, a lot of studies already showed that a fast start uh, is not necessarily uh, better for a better performance because they struggle to benefit from this extra, uh, to benefit from this faster start, likely because uh, uh, they are fatigued then. So that got me really busy, like, okay, what's the mechanism uh, uh, behind that? Uh, and therefore I compared the study with cycling. I'm not going to go much more into detail in that part, but we saw that the cyclists were well able to change their pacing strategy, where speed skaters were really holding back when we asked them to start faster. Um, but their fatigue at the end remained similar. There was the difference in fatigue between the two races was quite similar. Um, so we think that it has to do with some inhibition and the speed skaters have to keep on skating, keep on standing, where, where cyclists can go all out, they stay on the bike. And, and they will, will keep on rolling uh, with their, uh, um, keep on cycling. Um, but then I, I, I thought, okay, if it's not on the short track, it's not changing that fast. Uh, on the short track, sorry, in the short term, it's not changing. What happens on long term? Does pacing behavior, pacing strategy, does that change over time? Um, therefore, we use the four race sections. So the start and then the three full laps to define pacing behavior and we put that as a percentage of the end time. Again, to be able to compare different performance levels. And we looked uh, mainly at junior uh, athletes. And uh, in one study, we looked at the male junior speed skaters. We took the best hundreds under 19 in the Netherlands, uh, looked at their season best time and their pacing behavior there. Um, and went back in time and see what their best time, wa best time was in the under 17 age category and the under 15 age category. And here you see the development of their season best time. We divided them, them in three groups. So the elite was really the best 17. Then those who are average or just within the standard deviation of average, the sub elite. And then the, those who were yeah, at the end of the top 100. And we looked closer to their pacing behavior at these three age categories. And then we got this. <laughs> um, let me explain the graphs. On the left top corner, you see the start. 
the x-axis are, st and, and then in the right top corner, the first full lap, left bottom is the second full lap, and the last one is the last, so the 1100 to 1500 meter. And you see the development of the time they needed as a percentage of the end time, so relative section time is every y-axis, uh, in the relation to their age, so in which age category they were. And if we look at the first, the zero to 300 meters section, so they start, the black line is the elite, uh, you see that it becomes a little bit slower relatively. And that accounts for almost everybody except for the non-elite. And you also see that the elite are from the beginning relatively slower at the start. And that in the two middle, so the two full laps in the middle, it's the other way around. So the elite were relatively faster than the other groups. And they develop also towards a relative faster midsection. So in a graph that looks like this, we know that the velocity will go up, but relative to end time, you see a relative slow start and faster mis midsection of the race. And the second finding was that um, from the 700 to 1100 meter section, also the elites keep on developing towards an even faster uh, final last lap. So with it, it's, it's part the development oh yeah, and the graph is the extra relative faster final left lap. So in the development of elite athletes, also part of the development of the energy systems that this is changing. Um, but you do see a difference between those who are better performing and those who are less performing uh, at the junior mill. And we also see in senior competition, it was a previous uh, study of Mubauer in 2010 already, who also showed that there is a big relation uh, about the fast final last lap, so 1100, uh, 700 to 1100 meter section with a better end time at, uh, uh, he, I think he did a World Cup competition uh, in 2010. Um, so, so we see that this is um, more and more uh, shown in, different, in more uh, research, so that this final last lap is really important. Um, and with the question, what can we learn from this previous junior elite? We have these percentages, so the percentage of end time needed for the different uh, sections at different age categories. Um, and to make an another uh, comparison with the elite performance and then, for example, with the world record of, of Kjeld, of Kjeld Neus, um, you can see that even at senior level, his midsection is relatively faster than the junior performances, his start relatively slower, and his end time also relatively slower. Um, and I'm more focusing on this part, if I talk about pacing development, than on this first part, because uh, yeah, the start is always starting from velocity zero. And the faster you get, the harder it is to get to, um, or the, the larger the percentage is. So, so the increase in percentages from zero to 300 meter can, mostly be explained by that they have to start from, um, from f f velocity zero, but that their end time is really fast. So the percentage go up. Did, you know this is an extraordinary uh, fast opener, right? 22 I know, yeah. So, so yeah, but in percentage of, because he's also a really know. fast skater. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's why I'm focusing more on the, this final uh, last lap. And uh, I also uh, did um, compare this. No, I know it's not the time, but I know it's a really fast opener. Yeah. <laughs> it, it really was even like. Yeah, so opening fast. Run, actually. It was even faster. Yeah, so, no, so opening fast is really important, but you need to be uh, able to also have no, I, a fast final last the lap. Yeah, like. yeah. Also, in comparison, he, he skated then against Thomas Kroll in this race, and the biggest difference was also in this. Uh, final last lap, also because the crossing was a little bit uh, in his advantage. Um, but okay, uh, it's a single one uh, compared to our average um, performance of average uh, for a couple of. Uh, but I think it's an interesting to to also make that comparison there. Um, and again, we try to have this. So not the second part, but this table we put in the back end of the pacing tracker. <clears throat> the second coach tool, which also can be found on the same website, 
click then on pacing profiler and you go to uh, the website on the left and uh, this is an easier um, tool I think to use because you can just put in the finish time and the age of the athlete and oh sorry I don't have to uh, and the gender of the uh, the athlete and calculate their advice pacing profile at least the pacing profile the juniors of our study showed at that age with that time um, but do know we also have the pacing profiles in there from 13 to 18 years old so as you can see it will probably develop also towards senior level so that will be different but for the juniors uh, of great interest and that's i think most important about the pacing part yeah question do you guys take into consideration what lane they start and what lane they finish in for speed uh, no we don't take that in, uh, in no we don't and there are some studies about the effect of starting in or outer lane uh, but it's mainly, fo mainly focused on the 500 and the 1000 and I think with the development of speed skating the difference or the advantage uh, is now not st statistically um, proven anymore but the difference between the two and I think the 1500 meter is maybe less important but what you uh, yeah it might be interesting for this final last lap whether you can have the advantage in the crossing for this this lap uh, would be interesting yeah.